on chanting Haftarah for us this morning. We're doing things a little bit differently in terms of the order because I'm going to be heading over to our kids in just a minute to do some Torah study for junior congregation. Um, so I'm going to share some words this morning at this time as opposed to the usual time right before Musaf. And I think we are all aware that there is something of a crisis situation going on in the state of Israel at this moment with the protests that we have been seeing for the last few weeks, hundreds of thousands of Israelis nightly going out to protest, this against the backdrop of ongoing terrorism taking place in the state. Three people were shot, two seriously wounded at a cafe on Dizengoff, Tel Aviv this past week. And so it seems important that we at least speak about what is happening in the state of Israel at this time. Some of you may have seen that there was an open letter that was sent to the Jewish community of North America that was published in the Times of Israel um, by Daniel Gordis, Matty Friedman, and Yossi Klein Halevi calling upon the North American Jewish community um, to rise in protest against proposed judicial reforms. And I want to resist the temptation to tell you what I think you should do as American Jews. Um, although I will tell you a little bit about um, where I would argue I think the country needs to be looking to land towards the end of this rem these remarks. But instead what I want to do is try to help educate all of us, myself included, as to what has led to this moment in terms of the proposed reforms and the strong protests that we are witnessing against the proposed um, reimagining of the role of the judiciary in Israeli society. And so I've taken a few, and again, I am not an expert on contemporary Israel um, judicial reform, so I'm trying to, what I'm going to do is to try to give you some background to help all of us feel perhaps a little bit more aware of what are the underlying issues that lead to this moment for people to feel that they have a little bit more knowledge of what is currently causing these protests. So let me begin by saying that these protests, many analysts say that these protests probably go back to 1992 when the state of Israel passed a law that would give judges the power to block future legislation that would be passed by the Knesset. And on that day that that law was passed in 1992, an argument broke out on the floor of the Knesset that foreshadowed perhaps the fight over the role of the judiciary that we are seeing in Israel today. You are subjugating the Knesset to the Supreme Court, said Michael Eitan, who at that time was a very, very, very strong critic of the legislation that was proposed, which at the time was also attempting to enshrine basic human rights into Israeli law. And he felt and said very publicly that passing that law in 1992 would essentially cause the diminishment of the democratic nature of the state of Israel by giving judges far too much power to overturn legislation passed by a democratically elected Knesset. Now, the justice minister of that time was Dan Meridor, and he argued and essentially became the argument that was successfully uh, argued and the, the legislation was passed that the Knesset's influence needed to be balanced by judicial checks. Obviously, we in America are very familiar with checks and balances. We have a judiciary, we have a legislative branch, and we have an executive branch, and our founders intended that all three of those institutions would form a series of checks and balances on one another. And at the time, in 1992, when Meridor said, only those who see democracy as 
meaning specifically the rule of the majority and nothing else, think that giving the judiciary the role that it was given in 1992 would be anti-democratic. And so that legislation provided the legal basis for the Supreme Court to strike down laws in the Knesset that judges felt undermined fundamental personal liberties, like, for instance, the rights to privacy and property. Now, over the course of the last 30 years or so, the Israeli Supreme Court has used its power to overturn legislation in the Knesset approximately 20 times. Included in those 20 times have been restricting some Israeli settlement construction in the West Bank and also removing certain privileges that the Knesset has awarded to the Haredi community moves that drew the anger of both the settler community and the Haredi community. Now, critics of the court, who tend to be much more on the conservative and religious, that is, Haredi side of the Israeli public, believe that Israel should be a majoritarian democracy that gives its elected lawmakers primacy over the judiciary. The court's supporters, on the other hand, want Israel to be a liberal democracy with strong judicial checks on the Knesset. And they see the court as a last defense against a narrow coalition that happens to have majority in the government that may, in fact, have impose legislation that becomes actually very much tyrannical around a, a large minority of Israelis. Our current prime minister in Israel, um, as we know, has currently assembled a particularly conservative ruling majority at this point and is leading the effort to do a sweeping overhaul of the judicial system. The changes would restrict the Supreme Court's ability to reject laws passed by the Knesset, and it would allow the Knesset to override certain decisions made by the Supreme Court. In this way, it would give the current ruling government much greater, it would also give them much greater control over the selection of who becomes judges for the court. And critics believe that doing this would weaken one of the few checks on the government and how the government makes decisions. So there have been many, many efforts over the years that have attempted to weaken the role of the judiciary, but it has never been possible to do so because there has been a large enough majority coalition that has resisted the impulse to do so, which heretofore had been a minority desire from specific groups within the country. But this current coalition, with all of the Haredi parties united, all of the settler parties united, and the Likud have created the stable majority all of whom share an interest in these reforms. Now, you also have to understand that this also reflects a bit of a change of opinion over Prime Minister Netanyahu of about, a, about 10 years ago, who would have rejected this as something that he would have advocated, because he was quoted as saying in 2012, a strong and independent judicial system is what enables the existence of all the other institutions in a democracy. So clearly over the course of the last 10 to 11 years, Prime Minister Netanyahu has changed his mind. And depending on where you sit politically, you probably would say either he now has truly believed that the judicial branch has become far too powerful, or if you sit on another part of the political spectrum, you would say that since he's been indicted, 
by these very judges and courts. He wants to get more power over them to prevent them from continuing the cases against him. That's probably a matter of where you sit on the, on the political spectrum, how you see that issue. What most analysts say, however, is that the origin of this push, which we are seeing happening right now, emerged from um, a very important year in Israeli history, which was the year 2005. Does anyone know what happened in 2005 in Israel? Mm -hmm. Gaza. So the government of the time said that there needed to be the dismantling of Jewish settlements in proximity to Gaza. And this, there was a very, very strong minority of Israelis at the time who felt that that was a horrific idea to give up those settlements in proximity to Gaza and who strongly protested the government's decision to do that. But the Supreme, this court, the cases was taken to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court chose to rule with the government that those settlements in Gaza could be uprooted and 21 Israeli settlements there essentially were removed and you may remember those stories of the army having to come in and forcibly remove Israelis who lived in those settlements. And what happened according to many, many analysts is that the rage that those who were part not only of those communities in Gaza but who felt that this the right to settle this land was something that was absolutely a right of Israelis to do, are the people who became the strongest activists advocating for the overhaul of the judiciary that we are, not, we are now witnessing. And so many, many people believe that the, the origin of this movement to make these kinds of reforms really were galvanized in 2005 when those settlements were removed and the court did not inter intervene. The other part of what we are witnessing is that the power and growth of the Haredi community has been rising significantly over these last many years and as we all know, the number of children that Haredi families have is far greater than the number of children that non-Haredi families have in the state of Israel. And the Haredi community has viewed the court as being um, adversarial in terms of its ability to practice the kind of uh, Jewish life that they want to practice. What that, those of us who are a little cynical about the Haredi motives feel that you have hundreds of thousands of people who are recipients of Israeli taxpayer money that allows them to learn, men to learn in yeshivas until their 30s without ever having to work and pay taxes to the country and moreover who do not serve in the Israel Defense Forces and feel that while those in the Haredi community will tell you that the fact that they have so many of their men studying Torah and studying Talmud is actually more important to the security of the state of Israel than those who actually put their lives on the line and fight in the Israel Defense Forces is that their power and influence is growing and continues to grow. And so now when you have a coalition of um, a ruling coalition that contains a large block of people who feel that the power that the court exerted in 2005 around the removal of the settlements in Gaza and who have in the past re restricted some construction, not all, but some construction of settlements in the West Bank, aligned with an ultra-Orthodox, growing ultra-Orthodox community that wants to continue to say we don't want a government that's going to tell us we have to have our men serve in the army and we want those subsidies coming 
that allow them not to have to work so that they can study Torah. Those two groups combined with the current Likud party and the current prime minister are those who are most responsible for pushing the very, very significant change in the role of the judiciary. And you have seen, as I have seen, a large part of the Israeli community that is not Haredi and that is not part of the most, um, let's say, conservative part of the settler movement feel that this, if this legislation goes through, this will destroy the democratic character of the state of Israel. So much so that leaders in Israel, like Daniel Gordas, are calling upon people like me to stand before their communities and tell you, you have got to say, this cannot be. So what I want to say to you is this. I'm going to let you make the decision <laughs> about what you think the state of Israel should do, but I will argue with you that the worst thing that Israel needs right now is to have this legislation rushed and pushed through and make a radical change because this is a time, and by the way, President Herzog made a rare address to the, to the citizens of the state of Israel this past week in which he said, we need to come to a compromise. There, we need to acknowledge that there may be some judicial reforms that we need to consider seriously. But the only way to do that is to take our time, have dialogue, and have discussion, and come to a strong consensus about any changes that we might want to make in the character of the judiciary of the state of Israel. That is what the president, who rarely addresses anything related to the political issues of the day in the state of Israel, begged the current governing coalition to put a halt to the proposed legislation, which is set to be considered and potentially voted on this upcoming week. And I want to say that you may not have paid a lot of attention to this, but let me just say this. You may have been aware that as a result of the efforts of China, Saudi Arabia and Iran have now reestablished diplomatic relationships with one another. All of us are aware that the single greatest threat to the state of Israel is Iran. And its declared intent of wiping Israel off the state, off the face of the globe, once it has the capacity to do that. And Prime Minister Netanyahu has rightfully prided himself on helping to usher in the Abraham Accords with the Sunni Arab nations and has hoped that Saudi Arabia would soon reestablish diplomatic or would establish diplomatic ties with the state of Israel. But the idea that Saudi Arabia now has reestablished diplomatic ties with Iran is a huge issue facing the very security and safety and ability to survive of the state of Israel. If there's any issue that Israelis should be concerned about, it is that issue. And the idea that we have such division in the state of Israel as a result of this proposed le legislation makes me want to argue, and here's where I will tell you my opinion, this legislation needs to be put on the back burner and serious conversation that creates some compromise from both sides of the aisle need to be taken at a much slower pace so that you can get a strong consensus of the country to support any legislation around the changing of the judiciary. The stakes are too high right now for this kind of divisive legislation to be shoved through the Knesset and engender the kind of anger where leading members of the military are saying that not only should this not happen, but they are being supportive of those on reserve duty not going up 
and fulfilling their military obligations unless there is a true military emergency they need to do so for. President Herzog said in his address this week that he has met with both sides, that there is actually some consensus that really does exist among those who want this legislation and those who are opposed to it. And so what I would argue we should all be advocating is more time and the ability to come to a kind of compromise that will give each side some of what it wants, knowing that not every, no one gets everything in politics. You come to an agreement about what both sides can agree to, and that should be the role. There's too much at stake for this to happen with a kind of narrow legislative majority that currently exists and the potential for the fracturing of Israeli society at a time of such great concern would be a terrible, terrible blow to the state of Israel. May those of cooler heads on both sides of the aisle find common ground so that compromise can create the changes that the state of Israel needs. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. I'm going to now um, be leaving you as um, I invite those who are leading prayers for the